Joining us right now to talk about Ford's deal with the UAW, the implications for GM and Stellantis, and what this means long term for all of these com companies is Harry Wilson. He's the chairman and CEO of Mava Group. He was previously a senior member of President Obama's auto task force. And Harry, you joined us before and said that if the auto companies were to give what the union was asking, it would put them back in a terrible position. They wouldn't be able to be profitable. Does the deal, at least the, the terms of the deal that you know so far with Ford, uh, does that put Ford in a competitive position or not? Yeah, well, first of all, good morning, Becky. Um, I, you know, I give Ford a B minus overall. I think they, the wages, which I think are the most important part of the deal on both sides, landed about where I expected them to land, where I thought they should land. Um, but they also, uh, you know, one of the things we've talked about in the past is making sure they did not make concessions around long term structural costs that inhibit their long term competitiveness. And they did do that. They, for the first time in history, they gave up on the uh, right to strike for a plant closure which certainly limits their flexibility. They you know, dramatically increase temp costs way below, way above market. And so the combination of those two things do inhibit their uh, flexibility going forward, which was something I think they really needed to avoid. Wait a second. They're not allowed to strike anymore? Explain that. No, no, no. The, the, the UAW, so historically, the UAW did not have the right to strike over a plant closure. So if Ford decides they, you know, for example, there's a, you know, the passenger car demand is down, and so they want to close that plant. That didn't have the trigger the right to strike. And now Ford conceded that point for the first time in UAW history, which I think is, a, you know, given the dynamic uh, nature of the auto industry, everything that's going to change going forward over capacity uh, needs, I think that was, a, that was a big mistake. So you think that this is going to hurt Ford long term because they are not going to be able to be competitive and flexible? Yeah, I think, I mean, I like to say, I give it a B minus. It's not a, not a D or an F. Um, I think that the, on the wage side, I think it was, it was fair. But I think they, you know, they really needed to be vigilant around long-term competitiveness, and I think that's where they came up short. Well, that that sounds like a bigger issue than a B minus. Uh, well, no, I think it, you know it's not like they said they've given up everything. They didn't give up on the job bank. They didn't give up on the 32-hour work week. They didn't give up on retiree medical. They didn't retire on pensions. That would have earned it an F. Uh, but I think that they, you know, that's it's a balance, and I think that they came short of the balance. What do you give the union marks in, in this? Did they get an A I, or an A plus? Yeah, I think it, on behalf of their members, in the short term, certainly get an A. You know, the, the long term structural competitiveness issues cuts both ways, as you know, and I think that's where um, I think the union over overreached. Hey, Harry, just I just want to read this to you. Uh, Ford appears to have made the calculation that the high price is worth labor peace, which is the way collective bargaining works, uh, obviously, but. Uh, it's an op-ed piece. But, but the collective bargaining, this agreement, it's going to take a while to see if the, uh, the labor piece uh, helps Ford um, or, or makes it harder for Ford to pump the capital into the money-losing EVs, which the government and states are, are mandating. So, I mean, when, when there must be some level of equilibrium that, that you think will hit. I mean, you, you see uh, how many of the, the big three have already said, yeah, we're no way we're making uh, our goal. And they're not going to hit the government goals for EVs either if no one's buying them. You just expect things to, we were just discussing, you know, the things that need to be done for these to become mainstream. You think that, that catches up and things happen more quickly in terms of infrastructure and, and consumer sentiment and everything else? Well, so I think there are two separate issues. I think in terms of does this deal affect their ability to, to be successful on EVs going forward? Not necessarily. I think I said, you know, the issue is that it does reduce flexibility. Um, but, you know, it, it amounts to like 0.6, 0.7 percent of revenue. And so I think that's a manageable amount. But the, the broader problem that you're highlighting is that they're nowhere near being competitive on EVs. And just in the last quarter they just announced this week, they're losing $36,000 for every EV they make, which is actually up they, from they, where they it was. They need, they need automate. Well, Tesla has automation and lower labor costs. So, That's right. So that automation means that the UAW long term, that this deal could end up shrinking their ranks significantly so that 10 years from now the, the, the UAW might be half the size because they're, they, you don't need it to make the cars. So I think there are two, two parts to that. One, like you know, I mentioned earlier, there's no question that the deal creates long-term structural headwinds. So that's definitely a problem, and I, I agree with that. I think the other piece of it is that they haven't succeeded in, crack, in cracking the product code, and that's the fundamental problem the big three have. They don't have 
good EV products that attract the consumer. So when EV demand right now is about 313,000 EVs sold in the second quarter, which is in the zip code of seven or eight percent of total sales. And you're starting to see pressure on that growth rate because given range anxiety, given all the infrastructure issues, there is a today a practical limit about how many people are willing to buy an EV. And that is running headlong into higher rates, obviously, and reduced consumer demand. So that combination is limiting growth. And that growth has favored the you know, most popular EV manufacturer out there, which is Tesla. Well, hopefully the government still uh, has, your, has your number for the next time you got to go in and do a workout. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think we're going to need that anytime in the foreseeable future. Hopefully not ever in the auto sector. Some people do. We probably need yeah. that in other sectors. He says hopefully not ever. Yeah, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully not. Right. Yeah. Harry, we got, we've got to run. We're out of time. We'll have you back. I, I, I wonder what this means for the other two big automakers. And, and we'll have you back to talk about that because this is continuing. Thank you. Expect the gym deal very soon. Okay. GM deal very soon, you hear that? Okay. Maybe.